Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's so fun to have uh, so much talent and so many voices up here um, worshiping together. Uh, it's great. Um, today, as uh, Rust and Holly said, we are starting a series going back to the beginning, all the way to the book of Genesis. And the stories in Genesis 1 through 3 pack a ton of meaning for the foundations of who we are, who God says he is, and the relationship he desires to have with us. And as we explore this text, our preconceived notions of creation and the fall are going to be challenged in the best way. We'll see that God has, does, and always will want what is for best for us, that he desires this Hebrew concept called shalom. And this term has a range of meanings, including completeness or wholeness or often peace. My favorite definition is the way things were meant to be, the way God designed life or the good life. That was unintended, and that was amazing. I need more sound effects. <laughs> that, um, uh, let's pray before we get into this. Uh, dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you want us to know you, that you want us to be in a relationship with you. Um, help us to have open hearts and minds for what you're going to show us today um, as we dive into um, how you created this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we have to start off talking about reading the text, right? Addressing the elephant in the room, that we are not living in ancient Hebrew society, okay? From thousands of years ago, that we have formed our own ideas about the creation story from things we've heard, things we uh, have been taught, how we were raised, myself included. It's been uh, a great journey the past several weeks doing research and looking at what this text is really about. But the, the main thing to start with is that the Bible is an ancient text from a different culture, right? And we're trying to read it thousands of years later. And as we approach this text, it's helpful to think of ourselves as tourists in a different culture. And so what kind of tourist do you want to be? Are we open to different cultural ideas or do we expect things to be like the way we know them? Right. I remember when I was in uh, Tanzania, I got a chance to go on a trip, and we were talking with our guide, Freddie, and he was saying that the drivers, or the translators, would all dread it when they saw guests were from certain countries because they had a reputation of being demanding or rude or looking down on the differences that they encountered. And we didn't want to be like that, so we made it a point to ask Freddie about his family and what he liked to eat and the places he liked to go to uh, and to show us more of the culture of his hometown. And it made for an amazing trip that we wouldn't have had otherwise, right? He even hugged us at the airport as we left. And so people intend things, and we need to figure out what they mean. And language is the vehicle of explaining our intentions, right? But we're all limited by our time and culture. Even when we speak the same language, our time and culture can influence the meaning of those things, right? An easy example uh, is the word cute, originally meant smart or quick-witted because it was a shortening of the word acute, A-C-U-T-E. Okay? And we still use that a little bit when we say, don't be cute with me. Right? We're still using that same phrase, but really cute now means more like pretty uh, or adorable. Right? And so we adapt how we explain things based on the audience because we want to be understood with our intentions. And as audiences change, our interpretation of meaning gets more muddled as we are distanced from that original audience. So, for example, what does the word Nimrod mean? Right, it is usually implied that somebody is dumb or not very smart, right? In the Bible, Nimrod was a person, and he was a rebellious person who built the Tower of Babel and is referred to in Genesis 10 as a mighty hunter. And so the meaning of Nimrod changed because of Bugs Bunny. Right? He called Elmer Fudd a Nimrod, as in he is a bad hunter. And over time, we didn't know the reference. And so it just became this meaning that was ubiquitous with somebody who's dumb, right? Uh, but that wasn't the original meaning. Uh, we do this with Genesis as well. We take our ideas about what these things mean without being good tourists and looking at the context. So uh, as early as the fifth century uh, in Christianity, people debated about the literal six days of creation, okay? So pretty early on. St. Augustine held that it was a longer timeline for creation, while St. Basil believed in literal six days. 
and yet there was no church council to decide on an official doctrine in a time when they had councils for pretty much every other doctrine in Christianity. It was one of these texts that they more or less agreed to disagree on. And this is why we're not going to get stuck in the weeds debating issues that believers have differed about for, thousands or for hundreds of years. And the good news is that we are going to walk through this important text to learn of this incredible God that created us out of love and with a purpose. And so for most of Christianity, this was the same focus, right? Until after World War II. There began a growing group of modernists that began to question everything in the Bible, not just some things, but everything, including the virgin birth, the possibility of Christ's healings, and even the resurrection. And so a conservative group developed a response that went to the opposite extreme, that everything in the Bible is literal with a disregard to the context as a counter to this modernist movement to question everything. And so as most things, the truth lies somewhere in between. In the Bible, we find metaphor and narrative and it's up to the readers to be good tourists and ask questions to interpret what the Bible is talking about. And so we have to go back to who it was written to and their context to learn to recognize the difference. People in Middle Eastern culture speak using pictures often instead of abstract concepts. For example, when we look at descriptions of God, in the, Old Te or in the New Testament or in the Greeks and for us today, how do we describe God? that God is love, that God is holy, that God is just. Those are abstract ideas. We don't see those as often in the Old Testament. The Hebrews describe God as God is my shield, God is the vine, God is the bread of life. Right? They use pictures. And so it takes understanding the original culture and that it was written to in order to tell the difference and remove this current lens of where culture swings. Okay? So before we get too far into the text, we need to establish what this text is and the structure of the text and what it's not. Okay? So, the book of Genesis is not a science textbook. Even though there is much we can learn from Scripture and appreciate the nature that God has created, science requires observation and repeatable experimentation, and no human was there to observe creation and analytically write it down, and it can't be repeated in a lab. So, by approaching creation with this lens, we're being bad tourists. We're imposing our 21st century mindset of demanding answers to how instead of asking the ancient Near East question of why. Instead of asking how did God create something, we need to ask why did he create it at all to begin with. This story isn't for us to understand how the world came to be because it is a story. The point is not about new earth versus old earth or six literal days or gap theory. The question this text seeks to answer is why. Why did the world come to be? What does the way it's written tell us about who God is and what he values? How does it point us to the good life that God wants to have with his people? And so, what is this text? There are many scholarly debates about whether this text fits into more of the Hebrew form of narrative, it's more of a Hebrew poetry, and upon my own research the past few weeks, I had to put aside my own notions of what I thought this was and yield to scholars more experienced than myself. And the answer is, it's complicated. Genesis 1 has poetic elements, such as parallel phrases and repetition of ideas, but those elements aren't close enough together to fit the model of poetry. But then, all of a sudden, there's an exception in verse 27 that's very obviously a poem, and we have it on the screen. It says, so God created man in his own image. Sorry, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right, this poetic element, it's right in the middle of it. But yet it's closer to a narrative. We see a sequence of events, but there's only one character talking to himself, or at least the persons of the Trinity. There's a sequence of events, but then the order doubles back on itself to add a clarification. And this is why some critics of Genesis 1 claim chapter 1 and 2 contradict each other. The best way to describe Genesis 1 is that it is a narrative with poetic elements. Or another way to completely change how we describe it is it is a branch of ancient literature unique to this part of the world called cosmology. Not cosmetology, that's makeup. Cosmology is what we're talking about. Right? Cosmology is a doctrine describing the natural order of the universe. And most ancient civilizations had a cosmology or a way of explaining the creation of the world. And these stories are important because it establishes their worldview and the way that they thought about God themselves and how the gods interacted with them, right? The why. 
And so we're going to look at some creation stories or cosmologies from other main civilizations that the Hebrews would have encountered, the Babylonians and the Egyptians. And I want us to think about how they compare to the Genesis creation story and how they're different. So we're getting a little maybe more academic, but I think we can handle it, okay? So we're going to look at these three stories. I want you to think about the similarities and the differences in the cosmology that they tell, right, and why they would tell it a certain way. So here's Babylon. In the beginning, there was only undifferentiated waters swirling in chaos, and out of this swirl, the waters divided into sweet, fresh water, known as the god Apsu, and salty, bitter water, the goddess Tiamat. Once differentiated, the unions of these two entities gave birth to the younger gods. These young gods, however, were extremely loud and troubled the sleep of Apsu at night, distracting him from his work by day. Upon the advice of his vizier Mumu, Apsu decided to kill the younger gods. Tiamat, hearing of their plan, warns her eldest son, Enki, sometimes Ea, and puts Apsu to sleep and kills him. From Apsu's remains, Anki creates his home. Okay. Here's Egypt. At first, there was nothing but Nun, the primal ocean of chaos, which contained the seeds of everything to come. In this jumble of waters, the sun god slept. Finally, by an exertion of will, he emerged from chaos as Ra and gave birth to Shu and Tefnut by himself. In turn, Shu, the god of air, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture, gave birth to Geb and Nut, the earth god and sky goddess. Thus, the physical universe was created. Okay, one well, thing about why this version, what are they implying about what they think about these different gods and the nature of life? For a reminder, here is Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And we could keep going, but we're going to pause there for comparison. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to just break into some discussion groups, okay? Um, you, hopefully you can have a Bible with you. You can look at Genesis. Um, maybe we'll put the other ones on the screen kind of back and forth. We'll see. But what I want you to talk about in your group is what other stories, besides these three that we just read, have you heard about how the world came to be? And how does what people believe about their origin show what they value and their perspectives, right? Why tell that version? What does it say about what they think about God and themselves and their relationship with the gods, okay? All right, go. Break into groups. Uh, kids are going to be in the back. We are going to be talking about the Genesis creation story, uh, reading that, and talking about what it tells us about who God is, okay? Go. Break into groups, please. Use some great conversations. I encourage you to keep having them. Uh, I know it's never enough time to talk about all the things we want to talk about. This is just to get us excited for Life Group this week. All right. Um, so one of the things I always find fascinating about these different stories of cosmology, and somebody pointed out in our group that they start with water, right? That that is a kind of baseline thing. Um, and we're going to see that the Genesis story doesn't. It, it starts a little bit differently, and that's, I think, important. Um, the creation story from Genesis, I'm just going to rip this Band-Aid off, is not the earliest recorded cosmology. The Babylonian creation story, the Enemu Elish, is the oldest story found in stone tablets. But that doesn't mean the Hebrew story didn't come first, as they mostly had an oral tradition until Moses wrote the Torah. Um, so what it does tell us is the Hebrews were familiar with the other creation stories of their neighbors when they went to write down the Genesis story. They had in mind the way they recorded the Hebrew creation story. They're thinking about their neighbors. How, what did they think about how the world started? And the word choice of Genesis 1 is very poignant and intentional to point out the errors in the worldviews of these other nations. Okay? So, for example, the Babylonian and Egyptian stories start with chaotic waters, and the gods rise up out of them. But Genesis starts differently, right? Genesis 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. 
right? That part looks familiar, but notice the difference. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God does not come out of chaos. He is above it, and He controls it, and He brings order. Right? The Hebrew cosmology or creation story would have been a powerful and convincing challenge to their Babylonian and Egyptian neighbors. You have one God that created everything, not a pantheon of many gods, and this one God is not named, right, to emphasize that he is the only one, and that point is repeated 32 times in this story. Creation was intentional, not an afterthought or a result of violence from the gods. The creation happens by the simple spoken word of God, not through circumstantial actions. And this text doesn't name, I love this one because the, the mythology nerd in me loves it, that this text doesn't name the sun or moon, but just calls them lights, right? Because the sun and moon were major deities in the Egyptian and Babylonian mythologies, right? Ra, the god of the sun, those sorts of things, right? So they don't even say it. They don't even say sun and moon. It's just the lights because they're not gods, right? The story of God's creation is meant to show that his people will be different and their worldview will be different. In the beginning, the world was actually good, not a result of accidental conflict between the gods. That the brokenness of the world doesn't happen until later when people make that choice. The Genesis story also shows the scope of creating order from broad to specific. And again, we see a sequence of intentional order. There's a pattern of command, fulfillment of that command, details added, uh, details added and the pronouncement that it is good. And the ordered structure includes actually a series of sevens throughout, the, showing this idea of perfection. Not just the seven days of creation or the seven statements of it was good, but even the first sentence has only seven words in Hebrew, the in the beginning part. So this account of creation points to intentional design by a single deity who has the power to simply speak order into existence. I'll say that again, that this account of creation points to intentional design by a single deity who has the power to simply speak order into existence. There's a way this world was meant to be, and that is good. And so as we approach this text, we want to appreciate the logic of the narrative elements, the beauty of the poetic elements, and the implication through comparison of the elements of a cosmology text. Okay? So... Let's get into the actual passage here. I know that was a lot of intro before we get to the scripture. All right, so Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's important that in the beginning, God is there first, right? That is the first thing. Before anything else, before the chaos and the darkness, the author wants us to know that God was there and that he created and there's intentionality, that it didn't just happen. God made a choice. That the first statement sets the standard for what the story is going to be. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. In our language and culture, we probably have certain ideas about what heaven and earth mean, right? This goes back to being a good tourist. So picture what heavens would mean in your head, right? Maybe you imagine some sort of supernatural realm with gold and angels. And what about picturing what earth means, right? Maybe you picture a globe floating in space. But here, heavens literally means sky, Right? The ancient audience believed that the sky was where the spiritual beings dwelt. And earth literally means land. That there isn't a concept of a round globe at this point. Right? It's, it's very simple. Top and bottom. Right? God creates it all. Genesis 1 is probably better translated. In the beginning, God created the sky and the land. Right? Their concept of the world and what they could understand impacted how they told their origin story. But this isn't even about that. It's not an explanation of how we came to be or who we are. Again, it's about the why. This text is about who God is and his design for the way the world was meant to be. In the beginning, God created. This first chapter is all about God, not about us. The word Elohim or God is used 32 times again in the first 26 verses. It's about who God is. The Jewish scholar Philo of Alexandria, back in the first century, wrote a, a thesis about Genesis 1 in his work on creation, saying that there are five things that we can say with certainty that the author intended 
from Genesis chapter 1. That, that's what they intended to teach us. Here are the five things. One, God has existed eternally. He's there first. Two, God is one. That we begin to see the aspects of the Trinity. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The third thing is that creation came into being and is not eternal. That there is a beginning point. Four, that there is one created universe, not many. That everybody can't just have their own version. There is one version. And then the last thing is that God's good providence originally fashioned and currently sustains and cares for the creation. Right? He created it. He continues to sustain it. Notice that these things are about understanding who God is. We have to start finding power in saying, I don't know, right? If we knew everything about God and what he did, then we would be God. It's okay to say, I don't know how he did it, but here is what I do know about who he is. And that's the reason that he's given us his word to begin with, right? So, so we can build a relationship and know what he is like. In our relationships, we don't need to know how our spouses do everything to know who they are. Right? You don't need to know how machines work to be married to an engineer or know how to connect an IV to be married to a doctor. You need to know their heart and who they are. Showing interest in knowing some things is good and can help certainly grow the relationship, but it's not the end goal. In this, I realize that now this reference may be lost on a certain generation, but in the second Matrix movie, there's a moment when one of the council members is talking to Neo late at night. And he's musing about the machines they have that recycle the water supply in this futuristic society. And he says he has no idea how it works, but he knows the reason why it works. The why is to give them life-giving water, right? He says the same to Neo, who, to be honest, is the Christ-like figure in the whole piece, right? He says, I have absolutely no idea how you're able to do some of the things you do, but I believe there's a reason for why you can do them, right? That is what God desires from us, to know who he is, not how he does things. When we focus on this, we're asking the wrong questions and missing the relationship. We should seek to know why he does things, and then we'll be closer to his heart. So I want to ask a question that we're going to kind of brainstorm together here. Great. So I want to create two lists. I need to add a marker to our shopping list for next week. <laughs> yep, that's gone. Um, so I want to create two lists. Uh, I want to first talk about what are the qualities of God that we love or enjoy or appreciate. Okay? And then what, I want to create a list of the things he does for us that are great and encouraging and awesome. Right. So, shout them out. What are qualities about God that we like? Rustin, can you look or look in the bag and see if there's an extra marker in there? Okay, we look his love. Sorry, say it again. He's creative. Loving. Forgiving. Pure. He's close. Consistent. He cares. Great. Wonderful. All right. What about the things he does? All right. What are the things that he does for us that we love and appreciate and enjoy? He protects us. Gives hope. Forgives. Was that over here? Say it, Ansel. What'd you say? Gives us food. Companionship. Help. Say it again. Regenerate.
beat sin. That's great. Okay, that's a good list. So here's the question I want to ask. I want us to brainstorm for a second, and then you're just going to turn to someone next to you. So we don't have to make a big group, just whoever you're sitting near. Which do you love more about God? And is that a good thing for your relationship with him? Is it more important to you the qualities of him or what he does for you? So take like a, a 30 seconds, think about it, and then you have to just turn to someone next to you and chat for a minute or two. Go ahead and chat with someone next to you. What do you like more? And is that a good thing or not? Um, hopefully you're able to process that a little bit. I'll leave that up there for us to look at. Ultimately, the story of the Bible is about who God is, right? Um, and it's about who we are, and it's a story about God's relationship with us. And that's what we're going to be looking at throughout this series. So let's get into the purpose of the text. Why is this here? What is it about? And so we're going to go through verse 2. It says, The earth was without form and void. So without form and void is sometimes translated as wild and waste, and it is a Hebrew term called tovu vavohu. Can you guys say that after me? We're going to try. Tohu vavohu. Tohu vavohu. I'll write, I'll write on the whiteboard. <laughs> Sorry, teacher instincts. Uh, Sorry. T-O-H-O-V-A-V-O-H-U. It's in Hebrew, so that's not how you spell it. But tohu vavohu is the term. Okay. Tohu vavohu, it means wild and waste, without form and void. And this word is actually an automatopoeia for our English friends uh, in Hebrew, right? It means it's a word that sounds like what it is. So it's meant to make you visualize or listen for an empty void that is humming and being sucked into itself. Tohu va vohu. It's just this humming sound of nothingness and chaos. Okay. Uh, verse 2 continues, And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's interesting that at first it's described as the deep, which is the Hebrew word to home, which is connected to tohu. It's the same roots, um, meaning chaos, right? It's the deep, this picture of chaos. The Hebrew idea of the void is like this deep abyss or nothingness connected to something lacking order, right? And they often connect this concept to water, right? The deep, right? Great bodies of water were a thing to be feared in the ancient world because most people couldn't swim. Um, and they were filled with these unpredictable storms for sailors that they couldn't predict when they were coming. You can't see the bottom to know what's there. Uh, the salty water is purposeless since you can't drink it or use it to grow crops. It is the picture of everything that is chaos and lack of order. So we're going to learn another Hebrew word, okay? and that is ruach. Say it with me, ruach. Okay, great. R-U-A-C-H. And really that is that, that last sound, ruach. I know we giggle, but it's an actual letter in the Hebrew alphabet is that sound. Okay, ruach. Um, and that word 
is used to describe God's Spirit. That God's Spirit, the Ruach, was hovering over the waters. But it also can be used to describe breath or wind. Okay? So God's breath or God's wind was hovering over the waters. And when the Ruach of, or God's Spirit enters the picture, it's interesting how the deep changes into the waters, which is a less intense Hebrew word. Right? It says, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and then the Ruach was hovering over the face of the waters. While the deep implies chaos and fear in the unknown, waters can be a good thing and bring life. Right? We get a peek into who God is here, that there is God, or the Hebrew word Elohim, and then there is the Spirit of God, which is a different term, which is Ruach. It's the beginning of the picture of the Trinity, this relationship that God has with these different persons. Right? The Spirit goes into the chaos and darkness and brings out life and purpose. John makes a connection to this text uh, to another member of the Trinity in the first few verses of his gospel, saying that Jesus was also there in the beginning as part of this triune nature of God. And we see that in John chapter 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And Paul continues this thought about Jesus in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17, saying about Jesus that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So what is the purpose of this text? We've said it already. It's meant to show us who God is. He is one, but he is also in relationship, right out of the gate, first two verses. It's about a relationship. Later on, humans are called image bearers of God, and so we're also meant to evaluate as we look at who God is, what should our heart be if we're to be like God and represent Him? That Jesus was there in the beginning, and then He comes down to be with us. He knows God's heart for us, but also what it is to be like us. He demonstrates what the relationship with the Creator is meant to be. And because of His great love for that relationship with us, He dies on the cross to bridge the rift we had created in the relationship because of sin. And to help us remember what He did, we celebrate something called communion. And so we're going to do that today as we think about in the beginning, Jesus was there. And as we take the elements of the bread and the cup, the symbols of his body broken for us and his blood poured out, let's remember the great love that God has for his creation, that he would send his son to die for us. So we're going to set out the elements on uh, the front here uh, and play a little music. And as you feel led, come forth, take the elements, remember who Jesus is, and the relationship he want, wants with us. All right. Um, so to kind of wrap up our time together, <clears throat> I want to give you an encouragement that our faith does not depend on the story of Genesis 1 in the sense that informs us who God is, not where we come from. And when we get into the weeds of the how that no one knows, we miss the heart of the why, which we can know. So who is God? Who is he? This whole goal is about telling us who he is. Here are some scriptures that show his heart. Listen, church, and be encouraged. In Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, will he not fulfill it? Deuteronomy 4, 31, for the Lord our God is a mer merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to you. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And probably the most important thing God says 
because he says this of himself as opposed to what others say about him. In Exodus 34, 5 to 7, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. When we know who God is, we can find peace. We can find shalom, the way things were meant to be, us in relationship with him. So do you know him? Do you know who he is? God desires shalom, this way that things were meant to be, and he created intentionally to make order out of chaos. God was there in the beginning before anything else, and he was in perfect relationship with himself in the Trinity, and it's because of the overflowing of his love that creation begins. In the beginning, there was God, and there's comfort in that, but it doesn't end there. It's only the beginning.